Okay, so thank you all for coming. And uh, we are now starting our meeting. The, um, we have scheduled a panel discussion and we're very excited about this. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, uh, the Caritas Consciousness Project is a program of lectures, workshops, classes, and study groups focusing on evolutionary thought and ideas. We're a member-supported nonprofit organization. Uh, those of you who join us frequently may notice that you're not seeing the audience, you're just seeing the panelists and myself, Gloria Quedu, the moderator, and that's because I'm using a different format so that the panelists wouldn't get lost on screen with a lot of attendees. Uh, so if you have a question, and we're hoping we'll have some time at the end for, um, for questions from the audience. And so if you have a question, you will have to click on the little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and type in your question and hopefully we'll have time to answer some of those at the end. Okay, so uh, the theme of our panel tonight is a heart-centered activism. It seems that 2020 has not only brought a worldwide pandemic, but has also brought many existing societal problems to a head, such as systemic racism, immigration issues and abuses, economic inequality and collapse, climate change, a broken healthcare system, student debt, a corrupt criminal justice system, corruption at all levels of government, and an upcoming electoral crisis, to name a few. In spiritual terms, it seems we're experiencing the societal equivalent of a collective dark night of the soul. And yet, there has also been uh, for the past four months, an impassioned movement on the part of millions of Americans demanding an end to brutality and corruption and calling for justice and equality. This movement is important. I believe it has the potential to generate significant change if it can remain rooted in a deep heart-centered desire for unity and not succumb to provocations of violence and polarization. To address these issues from the perspective of higher consciousness, I've convened a panel consisting of five individuals who embody a combination of deep spiritual awareness, teaching proficiency, and activism. Each one is a heart-centered activist. I'm so grateful for their willingness to carve this time out of their busy lives to participate in this event. So let me introduce to you our panelists. Reggie Hubbard has held many senior strategic and logistical roles across a variety of fields, ranging from global marketing, digital and community organizing, government relations, international education, to presidential campaigning. He currently serves as a senior political strategist for Move On, managing their relationships, impact, and communications with Capitol Hill and among the broader progressive movement. In addition to his political work, Reggie is also a 500-hour certified yoga teacher and authored a thesis entitled Yoga and Spiritual Activism, Serving Humanity from a Sense of Devotion and Love. Reggie has taught members of Congress, congressional staff, leading progressive organizations, and individuals, sharing techniques for growing peace and ease as a foundation, not an afterthought. The focus of his teaching practice is to bring more peace and balance to activists and to guide the wellness community toward being more engaged, concerned citizens. Achieving this balance is how we catalyze transformative change. Welcome, Reggie. Thank you for being here. Love be Tashia Asante is an award-winning poet, activist, journalist, filmmaker, and author of seven books and two award-winning anthologies. 
She's founder and director of I Teach Love Institute, an educational platform and think tank promoting cultural understanding, community wellness, and spiritual inclusivity. Love founded and produced the World Pride and Power Conference, which featured keynote speakers Bishop Yvette Flunder and New York Times bestselling author Molly Dilma Samain. She also produced the ATDLA Los Angeles Black Pride Conference with over 40 speakers on community building, wellness, media activism, and HIV AIDS. In collaboration with President Clinton's Race Relations Initiative, Love organized a community dialogue uniting 40 nonprofit organizations from across Southern California to discuss the impact of racism on America's social and economic development. Love has spoken at and organized conferences, retreats, and virtual gatherings to address key issues such as racism, sexism, and access to preventative health care. She's made numerous appearances on television and radio in an effort to support the healing of humanity and the planet. Love is also presiding priestess of the Ile Ori International, did I say that right? <laughs> um, and the I Teach Love Institute, a radically inclusive Orissa society. Welcome, Love. Stephen Hatch trained with Father Thomas Keating in the 1980s and has lived a contemplative life ever since. His life work is discovering and practicing the connection between nature and contemplation. Stephen teaches two Christian mysticism courses at Naropa University and is the author of the contemplative John Muir, Spiritual Quotations from the Great American Naturalist, published in 2012, and Wilderness Mysticism, a Contemplative Christian Tradition, in, published in 2018. Stephen was interviewed in a recent film, The Unruly Mystic, John Muir, that came out a year ago. This is his third appearance with the Caritas Consciousness Project. Welcome, Stephen. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Montague Connolly is a Colorado medicine man herbalist who resonates with the sounds of African drums, rhythmic chanting, and Afro-Caribbean folklore, herbal men's health, herbalism basics, blessing with herbs, and many other esoteric and nature-related topics. He teaches several classes for the Denver Botanic Gardens Herbal Certification Program and is also co-owner of Giridon, am I saying that right? Giridon Apothecary, a business specializing in loose leaf herbal tea remedies. He leads community herb walks and offers both herbal and spiritual counseling to the community. He's a drummer for the annual Kwanzaa celebrations where he's often asked to speak to the children and rap songs about the many wonders of plant medicines. Montague plans to continue to use workshops and music to teach people in urban areas how to, how to access the many esoteric tools along with the earthly medicines growing around them. He received the Preventative Care Leadership Award from the Be Well Health Initiative in 2019 for being of service to diverse black and brown communities pushing them toward the accessible and immediate plant medicines growing all around them. Welcome, Montague. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Shakti Reddy, founding teacher of Inner Power Yoga. Shakti is a contemplative mythologist, ritual facilitator, and writer who presents a tantric approach to personal empowerment and social action. Through contemplative storytelling and mind-body practices, she offers a vision of deep peace and radical freedom. Shakti holds a doctoral degree for her work in mythology and depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute. She infuses esoteric teachings with real life meaning to create ritual that is both mystical and practical. She offers live workshops and online courses on mythic symbol and embodied ritual for soul artists and mystics. As a depth psychologist, 
Shakti facilitates embodied ritual for deeper meaning and connection. As a yoga teacher, Shakti's approach to yoga, Shambhala, and psychology stemmed from her undergraduate education at Naropa University. Her teachings call for radical authenticity and practical human engagement for an embodied experience of awakening to one's inner power. In her dynamic workshops, Shakti combines ecological awareness, social service, and mind-body integration to offer an inspired message of peace and personal empowerment. Welcome, Shakti. Thank you for being here. Okay, so that's our panel, our illustrious panel. And now I'm going to start with questions. And the first question is to Stephen Hatch. Um, Stephen, Albert Einstein famously said, you can never solve a problem from the same level of consciousness that created it. How can we apply this insight to a people's movement? How do we raise our individual and collective level of consciousness? Thank you, Gloria. Um, <clears throat> as with all questions, I always see a kind of both and uh, approach. I think that Einstein's um, statement is true in one sense and incomplete in another. Um, I think First of all, um, it's incomplete in the sense that what we're talking about now, uh, uh, oppression, uh, racial, gender, uh, oppression of the um, earth and uh, all of the other issues that we're dealing with um, come from a sense of distinction hardened into separation. In other words, there's different races, there's different genders, there's, uh, there's nature and there's the human. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there really are the problems. It seems like some people in spiritual circles want to say uh, they're a little, an illusion. Um, so I think it's important to recognize the fact that there are the distinctions and that there are uh, the, the oppressive aspects of our culture. Um, otherwise, um, people who feel oppression, uh, it's kind of like when you enter into a relationship, you have to have your own boundaries before you can join together uh, with the other person. Otherwise, you just merge with their concerns. So I think the incomplete sense is uh, that, yeah, you do need to stay on the, the same level as the problem for a while and realize the distinctions. In Christian mysticism, that's called logos. You think of Jesus of distinguishing between the wealthy who are oppressing the poor, the true self and the false self and so forth. Um, however, I think that the statement is true in the sense that we have to move beyond that level of distinction and separation in order to solve the issues. Um, Jung had said uh, in the context of alchemy, separate and join. Apparently you have to separate substances into their, their pure form, minerals and various tinctures and such before you can join them together into a, a new substance. Uh, so here is where we do need to move to a different level. In the Christian mystical tradition, that's called a Sophianic level. And that's where all of the things that have been distinguished, uh, different races, the different genders, uh, the problems that we have with the, uh, our connection to the earth, are viewed as parts of a larger whole. So you might call this kind of a horizontal union. And each tradition, of course, has a different way of talking about that. In Christianity, it's the body of Christ. So it's like you might say each uh, race, gender, species, um, uh, sexual orientation is like a different organ in the body and you need them all. And so there's a joining together on that kind of horizontal level. Um, in Buddhism, there might be the net of Indra where it's like there's this net and there's a jewel tied in the node uh, of each of the knots and every jewel reflects every other jewel. So, so they're all needed, same with the, the image of the web of life. So that's the horizontal union. And I think we really need more of that sense of how do we connect together? How do we all need each other? Um, on top of that, I think at the other level, the second level of moving beyond the, the level on which the problem is created is what we might call vertical union. Um, Howard Thurman, who was a spiritual advisor to Martin Luther King Jr. talked about he talked about that um, in spirituality, when every person goes into their deepest core, he said, then they come up inside everyone else. So I love that image. That's the sense of if, if each person and each 
each group goes to their deepest place, they kind of, they discover the underground aquifer that joins us all together. Yes. Um, and it's, it's from that level then that uh, we can find a deeper kind of oneness. And my understanding was that the, uh, the civil rights movement was based on that kind of sense that um, at one level, we're all children of God, or we're all brothers and sisters. And uh, from Thurman's mystical level, um, we're all one, uh, one in the divine essence. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. That was a beautiful answer. Um, I think also when we uh, reach that depth and where we are all one, when we tap into that, our consciousness goes up. <laughs> so that is definitely, uh, does anyone else on the panel have something to add to that answer? No? Okay. Then we will go to love, Tashia Asante. Um, and my question to you is how can we transcend and help others transcend the polarizing us and them mentality. Ashe. Uh, well, first, I just want to acknowledge um, the other amazing panelists and just extend love to each one of you and like to each one of you for the, the great work that you are doing to make the planet better for all of us. And I want to acknowledge you, Gloria, with the Caritas organization and the wonderful work that you're doing. And I hope that this and future gatherings helps to create visibility and raise funds because we need to support and sustain organizations like yours. They're so um, you know, meaningful and important to the work that we all are doing and to our gr the greater good of humanity. So thank to answer you. the question, yes, thank you. Your question to me was how can we transcend and help others transcend the us and them mentality? Yes. And, and first and foremost, I just have to give honor, and I almost forgot, but today to our ancestors. So I always like to just recognize the ancestors and know that they're always with us and we stand on their shoulders and they're helping us and keeping us strong to do this work. And we're in a heck of a fight right now, but we'll get back to that. Um, so how can we help people transcend that us, them mentality, which is permeating society in the world right now. It's not even just in America. We know it's, it's across the world that we're seeing this. So number one is we have to identify and expose the root causes of the us, them mentality. Where does it come from? You know, what is, what is driving it? And so what I wrote, and I'm trying to stay within my time here, but it's fear, quest for imbalance, power, wealth hoarding, and racial and other forms of intolerance are the root causes of it. And then two, I put work to dismantle the systems that hold the platforms that support, you know, this consciousness in place. So we have to dismantle those systems one at a time and, and be strategic in it because we know that it's so ingrained in, our, in the very fabric of our society. And then three, create and support events like this. This, this is a wonderful example uh, activities and communities that counter the tactics of those who promote that us them mentality that promote exclusion that promote intolerance that promote discrimination we have to continue to do events like this that counter their efforts and then lastly we have to expose the destructive effects of the us them ment mentality so we know that th that it's a destructive way of thinking that it increases conflict and poverty and wars and eco-destruction, health disparities, and sickness. And then the opposite of that is to show the benefits and the blessings of transcending that us, them, and mental us, them mentality. So we can get buy-in. We saw there was a work, and I can't think of his name today, of an activist who literally just started spending time with a member of the Ku Klux Klan. This is a black man. And he just started having these dialogues. He would go to this guy's business establishment on a daily basis. Because the thing is, I mean, we, we should not put ourselves in danger, of course, ever. But if we're not at the table, we can't, you know, we can't change these things. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, the, the benefits are cohesive existence, a healthy planet, wealth and resource sharing, reduction of conflict and wars, 
and a happier, healthier people. So if we can start to show that and we can start to exhibit that and use our platforms in the media, as long as we have a free press, because we know that's under attack right mm -hmm. now as well. Um, I think that a lot of people will get the buy-in and especially when people feel like they don't have to give up what they believe that, you know, if you believe a certain way, if you walk in it with a certain faith, you don't have to give up your beliefs to, you know, to move out of that us, them mentality. Thank you. No, you just have to tolerate each other's beliefs and uh, especially when they differ, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say that um, the beauty of being able to transcend us and them is that I believe that when you transcend it, when you come back down to this plane where there are differences, you see that us and them is actually us and them, which is actually beautiful, and us versus them. Mm -hmm. And so us and them allows us through understanding the the part of us that's all related, helps us to be able to look in love at the differences, yeah. as opposed to saying us and them as an ugly uh, a blemish to get rid of in the same way that the liver cells are di differentiate than brain cells, mm -hmm. but the brain cells have no energy with the power from the glucose regulation that comes from the liver because the brain has none of its own, uh, it has none of its own storage resources to store energy. It, it solely depends on the liver and that's why liver cleansing or liver uh, enhancement is so important, but that's the, it's not for them to merge and become one thing. <laughs> it's for them yeah. to realize that they're on the same team. And that's what happens when, um, for example, you have autoimmune diseases where the body's attacking itself. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? There's a disconnect in the system. And what we're, what we're experiencing is as a nation and beyond the nation on the world is we're having this huge um, autoimmune thing that's happening mm -hmm. in the system where we're not able to differentiate enemies from friends. It's true. Yeah, that's a good, it's a great okay. metaphor. I, I also think, I often think of um, something the Dalai Lama uh, has said, which is everyone without exception is trying to be happy and avoid suffering. And I think that we all, we, we all have that in common, although we have different strategies, clearly, uh, for achieving it. But if we remember that this is this person's strategy, it may not be my strategy, but we all have more in common than, than we have different. And, and so reaching, doing, you know, just engaging in conversation that leads to greater understanding, like, you know, like the, the person who was talking to the Ku, Ku Klux Klan uh, member that's amazing that's amazing engagement right and and from that uh we start to we start to notice what we have in common what we you know and we can share our ideas um okay so the next question is to reggie uh buckminster fuller observed you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Uh, since you are involved on Capitol Hill, uh, do you think he's right? Or is there a chance that change can yet come from within the system of government, the judiciary and law enforcement? And if not, where do we start to build a new model? Ruth Bader Ginsburg famously said, real change, enduring change happens one step at a time. So what are the first steps that we need to take? Thank you for the question. And thank you also to those who shared beforehand. Uh, one of the best, uh, I was talking to my brother the other day and he was like, you forget that you're a scholar and an activist, right? So like being in community with you all and pondering and pontificating about things of the higher mind is actually filling my cup for the work that I have from tomorrow through the 4th of November. So I wanna thank you and give grace and gratitude for this spiritual edification as I take my step toward living my Dharma for the next couple of weeks. So blessings on that and thank and gratitude. Um, you know, I wanna pick up 
on some of the wisdom that was shared earlier in that, you know, we, I really resonate with what Steven said in that the deeper we go, we find that, uh, we discover that underground aquifer because that is a, it, it resonates with me because that is the secret to my, my activism, meaning I work for Move On, which is decidedly progressive and decidedly leftist. And during the impeachment uh, situation, which happened a year ago, I went to my colleagues and was like, so who are we talking to on the conservative side about this? Mm -hmm. And they were like, what do you mean? I'm like, this isn't about progressive. This is about the Republic. And it's in their best interest to have a functioning government too. So we can be stuck in our little lane and talk about doctrinaire progressive values, or we can take it to the higher mind and talk about preserving the Republic. I'm here to preserve the Republic. And if that means I got to talk to some conservative folks, then that's what that means. And everyone's like, Err. and so long story short, we got the conservative people to be a part of my impeachment rally. And why do I, why do I render that story? Because if we had adhered to the prevailing logic of my colleagues, I never would have reached out to them in the first place because we have nothing in common. And prima facie, we didn't have anything in common if you looked at it from the standpoint of like, well, they're not progressive. <laughs> well, when you dig a little deeper, um, as Stephen alluded to, we have far more in common than we do that separates us. So I say that to say this. We cannot change the systems that we currently have with our current philosophical and confrontational orientation, right? That is not possible. I don't believe that systems are agnostic. You know, systems are processes that are run by people. So we have to change the way that we view one another. We have to change our consciousness. And with that elevated consciousness, we can take, so the same system, somewhat controversial, but hear me out. Barack Obama was president of the United States. Donald Trump is president of the United States. Same system, mm -hmm. different operating consciousness. Same system, right? So if we can use these systems that we have, you know, yes, they need to be retrofitted. Yes, they need to be updated. And yes, they need to be more ecumenical and um, broader in their implementation. But I do believe that the system can, it, it can help us the systems do need to evolve, but what needs to evolve more so is the way that we view one another, right? So in fact, you know, I tell my colleagues all the time, they're like, us Democrats is like, I'm an independent. Mm -hmm. Like this partisan stuff does nothing for me. Like I'm a humanitarian. Like if, if I were to ascribe a party, like I'm for, I'm, for the, I'm for the empowerment and the betterment of humanity. Like that's my party. Um, so if we had that level of consciousness, in the Democratic and the Republican Party where we saw opportunities to connect, then who, the systems will be fine, but the people running the systems are, are what needs to change. So that, that's what I would offer. Um, having said that, you know, things need to be reformed, right? Mm -hmm. There are certain operating norms and certain, op certain operating standards that have been adhered to, or what did Stephen say? Just we have hardened and we have seen distinction and that hardened into separation, right? Mm -hmm. So our systems are distinct, but we have become so calcified in demonizing one another rather than seeking mutuality. You know, there's a quote that I'm gonna mess up, but it comes from Dr. Martin Luther King, which is, you know, we, have, we, are, we are bound together in a web of mutuality, <laughs> right? Like we have so much in common and that's what needs to evolve from my reckoning. Right. So my activist work is rooted in finding the commonality that exists between the least of us, meaning like, so, and listen, I'm doing all this in brown skin. Right. So like it's somewhat subversive for a black male to be in the system because the system has tried to destroy us for years. But, you know, shout out to the wisdom of love. Like I rest on the stories and the success of my ancestors. So I know they're not going to put me in a spot where I don't belong. So I'm using my access to these systems to reorient people's mentality so that through, through that reorientation of mentality, maybe we can take the steps needed to, to make one another better. As opposed, I don't believe in revolution. So I'll close by saying this. I don't believe in revolution. I believe in re-evolution, <laughs> not revolution, re-evolution. 
So how can we look at a certain circumstance from a higher mind as opposed to burning the thing to the ground and then kicking around the ashes? Well, all of us get our feet dirty in that, in, in that circumstance. So I believe in re-evolution, not revolution per se. Thank you, Reggie. Okay, um, Montague Connolly, since you work with children, do you have any thoughts as to how we can reinvent our system of education to teach children about justice and equality beginning at an early age. Absolutely. Um, so much of the issues and the seeds that are planted in children um, that grow throughout the 12 grade span that they're in schools starts with a lot of stories. They start with stories that seem so innocent, um, that seem so factual, but upon further observation, you see that they're actually marketing tools so that when these people come out of school, they know what to buy. You know, they know who to go to when they need, when they need health, when they need health advice. They need, they need to know who to go to, you know, as far as basically any need they need, they're being programmed from <laughs> kindergarten and up for this. And so, and so if we're not examining the wording in these stories, then there's, big inequalities that start really early. For example, in elementary school, a very dangerous story I learned was that the white people went to Africa to pick up slaves. Now that seems like an innocent historical fact, but it's a dangerous wording when you imply that they were slaves waiting to be picked up. <laughs> you know, in my mind as a child, I'm saying, wow, you know, they went and picked us up. We were just hanging there on a slave tree waiting to be picked up because we were already slaves. We were never taught that these were fathers, mothers, there were families that were being trafficked. You know, there were healers, these were farmers, gardeners, teachers, statesmen, you know, very, these were full people, not some distant slave idea, you know, that we can't connect with. They are who, they were who we are today, the same blood, the same genes, you know, full people. And if we're gonna talk about heart-centered change, then we have to change these stories to where kids can connect to the reality and to the, the, the whole being that is being sort of taken away when we call people slaves or when we talk about um, the good Indian leader that made the deal. You know, that's one thing we were learning about in school was this story about there's this noble savage, there's this noble Indian who said, white man, I won't fight you. I will sign this treaty. Oh, look, you, 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 you backpedaled on that. That's okay. I'm a good Indian. So I will sign another treaty. It's a very dangerous narrative to imply that fighting makes you a savage, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that's one thing that needs to change is we need to see the divinity in fighting. We need to see if you're fighting for a right cause, if you're fighting for your land for Pete's sake, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that there's a time to do it. And that wisdom is knowing when to fight and when not to fight, but it's not just not fighting, you know, because we, as those of us who meditate, who, who work with the chakras know the root chakra, you know, and what's the root chakra dealing with? We're talking about actual space here, you know, we're talking about physical laws, we're talking about things that keep us alive, things that give us a platform to where we have a space to meditate a space to grow foods and connect with nature, a space to connect with raw, untouched nature, you know, all these things that can't happen without some sort of protection, some sort of fire sometimes to ward off ideologies that might destroy it all. And so these stories are so important. You know, it can be very dangerous when we teach kids about how, for example, like trees as, as, as an it, as opposed to as a being. You know, it's a very dangerous thing because what it does is it says, okay, cool. We learned about trees from a scientific, you know, perspective, which means it's just an it, which means, oh, still more marketing because I've sucked the life out of this thing. So when people come and chop them down, when the nature's, when, when, when natural resources are being exploited, we have still, there's no heart connection there. It's just a dang tree. It's just wood sitting there. We don't learn about how the trees are communicating through their roots to each other, through the mycelia that are in the, uh, the fungi that are in the dirt, that they're actually able to share resources. 
you know, with each other, that, they, that there are certain stumps that they found that are not dead trees, but that they're fed underground through other trees that love them. That these trees are communicating all the time through pheromones through the leaves. And I'm using trees as an example, but this goes into, this ties into a whole narrative where we're othering or uh, machinizing nature for the exploitation that the huger corporations need us not to fight for. Because once again, fighting is evil. You know, you know, we want to be like the good Indian that signed the paper, you know, and, and didn't do anything because that's what a sage would do. That's what, what would Jesus do? You know, uh, they leave out all the stories of Jesus where he was wrecking, wreaking havoc, you know, for people who were blaspheming. They don't tell the stories of Martin Luther King when he was saying things that were making people uncomfortable. You know, so they want they want you to they want you to put him in that same narrative. And there's so many things to touch on here. Um, and it's a very passionate subject for me. But there's but one of the key things is that we have to retell these stories in ways where people can see that we're dealing with actual living beings, that they can form a love for these things so that we'll have a planet left. So we can have people that don't tolerate exploitation of people in the way that our forefathers were allowed to, you know, our American, you know, taught, scientific, rationalized, you know, uh, forefathers. Um, but there's so many things, I don't know how much time I've left, but um, we also, I feel like we also need to give them tools from kindergarten all the way up that reflect the realities that they're gonna run into. You know, not some distant, oh, here's a math, here's an algebra, here's, those are things that are great. Those are the core curriculum. But there needs to be a core curriculum based on what these people, these children are gonna run into. I'm talking about character development, what is abuse, what is love, you know, um, what, is, what is prison, uh, what, is, what is credit, <laughs> you know, all these things, you know, because it's a shame that people go through 12 grades and come out and say, wow, what am I gonna be in my life? And that's dangerous because what happened through all that time is we were telling them another false story. The false story is rooted in a question that we ask, which is, what are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> As if you're nothing today. <laughs> My daughter draws all the time, beautiful things. She's an artist today. She sells the little jewelry she makes. She's a jewel, jewel, jeweler today. Mm -hmm. not, not what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you right now? Mm -hmm. OK? That's a very important thing. We're talking about heart-centered connections. Stop making, just stop having some, stop telling this lie, this abstract adulthood that pops up, that you're no longer that child that went through all 12 grades. No, you're still the same person, you know, at your essence. And you've always had certain things that you've always had an inclination towards. And that those things should have been found early and they should have been seasoned early. It shouldn't have been, oh, I've graduated, you know, how much money am I going to spend trying to figure out what I want to do with my life? It's, it's, it's a scam, you know? There's people in other countries that know how to do, um, do, do things you wouldn't be able to believe, you know, <laughs> as a 12-year-old. You know, you're like, you're fixing electricity, you're building. I went to Haiti, they were building, like, houses and things at, like, 12, you know, 11, you know, things like that. But we have this false narrative that's very dangerous. And we need I remember a story. I remember a story, reading a story, a little story about a little girl who was talking to uh, a voice teacher, and the voice teacher said, "I teach adults how to sing," and the little girl said, "You mean they forgot?" <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Right? laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop right there. I don't know what my time oh, is. So. I, I love what you're saying. And we do have time because um, we've, we've gone through the questions faster than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. well, well, you know, just to finish some, my points, I had just a few. One of them is also, you know, connecting these children to the land early. You know, because I feel like a lot of the fear we're talking about is rooted in a feeling of scarcity. Now, granted, there, is, there are real issues, you know, systematic issues, but we still need to give these children things that they can do now. You know, what can you do now that, you're, now that we've given you these tools from kindergarten that you didn't know you needed, now that you're old enough to understand what's happening, why do you need to know these skills? Because maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's some sort of discrepancy or whatever where you might not be able to afford the Western medication. 
So, wow, look, growing in your yard is dandelion. What is dandelion for? What is the, what is the Latin name of dandelion? Oh, it's Taraxacum officinalis. Why is it called Taraxacum officinalis? Oh, officinalis means it was one time used in the American pharmacopoeia. You know what I mean? It was an actual medicine, an official medicine that doctors were using before this technological, you know, sort of, you know, breakthroughs that, that we give credit to our current medicine. But people were using <laughs> so many things growing yeah. right around them that we spray today to grow grass. You know, I can't tell you how many times I'm walking by someone who's having some sort of issue that they're complaining about while they're spraying and killing the the plant that's growing right there that actually remedies the thing that they have going on you know i can't stress the growing of food you know um and things of that nature and the last thing i want to say just really well actually two more but i'm not going to take too much time to say it we need to stop demonizing our fire children the kids that rebel you know the kids that stand up to the teachers because those are the ones that are going to be fighting for justice later when they when they realize what's happening you know it's not the calm kid oh this is a good student oh, you know that's not the one that's calling these people out you know what i mean that's not the ones fighting the power it's the ones that have been fighting the power since they were kids you know so we have to find another when we're talking about stories we have to get rid of the good story bad, i mean the good kid bad kid narrative as well and honor each element that manifests not just in theory because oh i love sagittarius is in theory you know oh i love you know no in real life and you know when you're being challenged how can you humble yourself and and honor that person's power and say wow i see a future leader in you yeah. you know what i mean things like that and the last thing sorry i just when you gave me this question it's so loaded but the last thing is <laughs> that are more um, more open to using alternative medicines in the classroom you know and what I mean by that is I'm talking about light essential oils in the air you know what I'm saying burning burning different things I mean whatever's legal of course but you know burning sage or things like that to affect the psyche subconsciously so there's not such a huge fight in the classroom you know some of these kids are just starving when I was a kid I used to love Captain Crunch for example and I'd go to school and be hungry yeah. why is that it's, because, it, it's, it's part of this whole story around I, but I never learned to differentiate the, the, the aspects of self that, my, that through the Captain Crunch, I was feeding my emotions, not my body. Mm. And so my body needed minerals, it needed vitamins, it needs all these things in order to focus, but I was using my body as a tool to just feed my, to just feed, I mean, I was using my body as a tool just to feed my emotions and nothing else was being fed. So these are just things that I feel like need to be taught to kids, need to be taught to parents, and need to be talked to with teachers that will listen. The teachers, yeah. And, uh, you know, my daughter used to have a children's camp, uh, which was wonderful and wonderfully creative. And, and she had all ages, you know, from like three or four years old, right through uh, sometimes early teens. And uh, it was a summer camp. And when the kids would get rowdy, one of the things that she would do is she would take them outside. This was in the Catskill Mountains. So there was lots of, you know, beautiful land around the, the camp. And so she would take them into the woods and she would say, find your spot and then sit down and just observe you know, just look around and see everything that you can see. And she would give them 20 minutes or so to just, just look at everything they could see. And, and, and then we'll come back together and you can tell us what you saw. And so they would sit there very quietly and they would look around and they'd see the leaves and they'd see the, the bugs and they'd see, you know, all of the things in the forest that, uh, that was living and interacting and all of this. And, and then they would, and then she would call them back together and they would very excitedly uh, tell her everything they saw. You know, I saw a branch that looked like a frog and I saw this and I saw that. And they loved this exercise and it would totally calm them down, you know, instead of the alternative as you're pointing out, Montague, of uh, just labeling this kid as a troublemaker, right? So 
Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful answer. Anybody else? I think Reggie might have had something to say. And I, I do too. I'll go after Reggie. Great. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll be quick. I just want to thank I you. For, to I want to thank you for that frame, Matthew, because, because um, I wrote stories when I was four. Right. Those were the gifts that I would give to people. Like for, for whatever reason, I would hand write a book and give that to someone. <laughs> Right, so it makes, of course I'm a storyteller now. Like, of course I'm a wisdom keeper now. I've been writing stories for 46 years, right? <laughs> and, you know, shout out to fire children because, you know, if you, if you train them the right way, they do good things. Yeah. Love, you had something? Absolutely, you know, love everything that um, Montague had to say. And uh, I started it with my daughter very young, you know, and, and in terms of just the individual work, you know, countering the effects of racism, I love something Montague said about, you know, preparing them for what they're going to encounter in the world, which I think is key in how well they do because, and, and, and it was something that was, I wanted to circle back to what Reggie said about the, um, it was kind of akin to the cancel culture, but it was also about the con con confrontational style of activism and you spoke to that. And I thought that was really important to this discussion around activism today. Um, with, and I wanna say with my daughter, what I did very early was I started to affirm her, her own Africanness and you know her being so that when she went out to the world and she got called the N word or someone tried to say she was ugly because of the texture of her hair or the color of her skin, she already had a countered message that had been planted inside of her you know, by someone who loved and affirmed her, by her parents, by her family. So I think that's also a powerful tool for kids and not just our own kids, because where I grew up and where I was born, I should say I didn't grow up there, but where I was born in the city of Chicago, everybody in the community was your parents. Everybody was raising you and implanting their wisdom and their medicine in you. So it was a very powerful, you know, uh, experience for me. And then the last piece is, you know, Reggie, you said some things and I tell you rarely, you know, as an activist who's been on the front lines for 30 something years, do I hear things that make me go, wait a minute. <laughs> and it was something so powerful that you said, you know, you talked about working with broken systems. You talked about looking for mutuality and, you know, re-evolution. And, and my immediate sense was like resistance because it's like the people that, you know, we're working with is like, we're dealing with now in this particular fight are so lethal and so dangerous. I mean, you know, we see these images every other day of, you know, black men, black women, young black kids, you know, and people of color and conscious as well as our allies being, you know, mowed down, killed, shot, you know, beaten, you know, in, you know, jailed, in prison, taken away by unknown people. I mean, when you're fighting a war like that, things like looking for mutuality, for me, I'm like, what? No, nah. <laughs> you know, that's not gonna work. But as I sat here mulling over the things that you said, there were some interesting points in that. And I would be, you know, really uh, interested in hearing more about that and learning more about the strategies that you uh, described here. Because, but, but I want to say this, I'll say this and I'll be quiet, that the accountability and reparations for me, I feel like it has to be part of the plan. It's like we can't have healing without accountability. We can't you know, bring balance back if we don't acknowledge the wound. That's the concept of Sankofa. You know, we have to go back and fetch it. We have to go back and deal with the past. We don't have to get stuck there. And I don't believe that we should get stuck there, but we have to deal with what happened in the past if we are to actually work toward a real solution that's gonna change things, you know, authentic change, not just put a Band-Aid on the situation. But, but I'm really interested in this mutuality piece and this re-evolution. I, I like those concepts. Thank you. Uh, you know, speaking of children, um, I don't know if you saw Michael Moore's movie, um, oh, what was it called? Um, Where to Invade Next. And he goes to these different countries and he, you know, steals their ideas, which are often based in ideas that we had to begin with and have drifted away from. Uh, such as uh, no cruel and unhuman punishment in prisons and that kind of thing. Um, but he, he goes to Germany and he goes to the school 
and the lesson that these little children like maybe eight or nine years old are learning they're learning about uh nazi germany and and how the jews were tortured and killed and gassed and and uh and their assignment from for that night was to pack a a, a, a very small bag uh with you know, just a few things that they wanted to um, take with them because the next day they would be suddenly, uh, you know, like if they were hiding, they would be suddenly caught and taken away to a concentration camp and might never ever see their home again. And, and so they had to think about the things that they would take that meant the most to them uh, just a handful of things they would take and they would have to pack their bag and I guess the next day they would, you know, act out some sort of scenario. But I was so uh, moved by that because it was driving the point home as to how it felt, how it would feel to be just taken away from your family, your home, your neighbors, your, everything that's familiar to you. And um, you know, just because you were Jewish. And so I think that, you know, when you talk about acknowledging, uh, you know, the, the, the harm that we've done in this country, you know, to Native Americans, to Blacks, um, it, it has to be an acknowledgement. It has to start there. But I think it starts there through, again, engagement, social engagement where we talk about it, maybe like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission on a, on a community level, every community having this, this, you know, this gathering on a regular basis where, you know, people talk to each other and get to know each other so that they understand more about, you know, their similarities and their differences. So anyway, okay. Um, so Shakti, I have a question for you. Ready? Um, Carl Jung said, if you want peace in the world, everyone needs to own his own shadow. And as you know, being a depth psychologist, the shadow which constitutes a part of us that is unacknowledged, repressed, and ultimately projected onto others is the opposite of how we like to think of ourselves and how we like others to see us. I think that as a country, the image we presented to the world until recently, <laughs> represented by the Statue of Liberty, is an archetypal expression of compassion, generosity, equality, and tolerance. This image is not only what our propaganda has presented to the world, it's also what we're taught in school. The resulting rift in the collective psyche is evident right now as our darkness becomes increasingly evident to the, our greater population as well as to the world. But those who refuse to own this shadow projected onto others, onto immigrants, onto African Americans, women, LGBTQ, and people living in poverty as the perpetrators, resulting in the split collective psyche and increasing polarization. The only way to heal the split is to look squarely at our shadow, collective shadow as well as individual shadow, and begin to acknowledge our individual and collective part in it. How can we encourage this shadow work collectively as a healing tool? Mm. Thank you, Gloria, for the question. And such a beautiful unpacking of shadow, what it mm. is and how it works. And thank you, everyone, for your answers so far. They've all been very inspiring. And um, I have a lot of synapses going. So mm -hmm. thank you for all of that. And, and love, thank you also for bringing in a recognition invocation of our ancestors. And I just want to further that by bringing in and invoking uh, and honoring the seven generations to come. Because without an awareness of that, we can get a little bogged down. And I think it's really important to remember that there are people coming behind us and this work is for them. It's for us, but it's for them. 
because this is not an overnight endeavor. This is something that is going to take our commitment, our, our heart, and, um, and some, some massive shifts. And based on your question, it's a psycho-spiritual uh, conflict. So what we've been sharing is so true, and there's so much so much outward expression of uh, communication, of recognition that has to happen. But as Jung said, and deep psychology or depth psychology clearly identifies that without the inner work, there is no chance. There's no, no chance of the outer uh, transformation to happen. So my approach isn't inside out activism truly that is um you know a psycho-spiritual reformation that has to occur and as you said it's the recovery of shadow where the healing happens is in the integration of shadow so it's not just recognition of shadow it's also the integration of shadow it is taking all of the projections that have been scattered into the creation of the other so going back to the question that was presented to love this is clearly according to the deep psychology the origins of other you want to talk about how did it happen where did it start it starts inside with this se separation and suppression of your own stuff that you're not interested in owning and that gets projected as you said and that that's going to take i have three words really that keep coming up courage curiosity and compassion mm -hmm. and the courage piece is so crucial right now because we anytime there is a shift of consciousness which is really what a awakening or an illumination of shadow is right when you illuminate the shadow, what happens is that everything that you are conscious of has to shift. So the way that you see the world and the way that you see yourself in the world is going to change. Anytime you learn something new, and particularly when you allow something that is unconscious come to the surface, that is scary for a lot of people because it means displacing what they thought they knew. And that's going to take courage. And especially in our culture, where we have glorified knowing things. We glorify being right. So much so, in fact, that we adhere tooth and nail to our rightness. And to the point where we're defending it, where we're doubling down on even the things that we're saying that are blatantly incorrect. Right. And so this is going to take a lot of courage to be able to see the 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 darkness inside those things that you don't know and you don't want to know about your own inner workings. Very, very, very important to model this on a day by day level to be able to say, I am wrong. And what don't I know? This is the optimal question what don't i know whenever there's a conflict or a feeling of unease disease what don't i know and i think that it's time for us to start actually honoring the unknowing parts for everything that we know there's millions of things we don't even know that we don't even know and to be able to step into that groundlessness of being that discomfort that comes from the unknowing with a sense of ease and comfort because that is the way that it is no matter how we want to patch it or you know as love said put a band-aid on it there's always going to be a groundlessness because that is the way that it is there's so much that we don't know so courage and then curiosity comes from recognizing that there is power actually there is freedom actually the ultimate opportunity for freedom and for peace ultimate peace comes from that 
that, that uh, letting go, that release of the grasping, the need to be right, the need to have ground, the need to be in control, the need for the ego to be the king or the queen, you know, on the throne. And so this idea of curiosity, what can actually happen if I let go? I'm thinking of this story, this old, do you remember the book Illusions by Richard Bach? Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember that old book? It was so popular in the 70s. I'm kind of dating myself. In the beginning of the book, there's a preface. And I don't even really remember how the preface related to the story. It seemed like this totally different kind of uh, story. But it was about this little piece of plankton that was just adhering to a rock. Do you remember that? And the whole, the whole kind of development of this story, it was just a couple of pages, was that this plankton was just watching these other little life forms going down this river and letting go. And he was so, or she was so perplexed at this, what's gonna happen if I let go of this rock? And of course, as soon as the plankton lets go, the adventure begins. Mm -hmm. So this idea of just letting go and that there's gotta be some curiosity in that because here's the thing too, we focus a lot in shadow work on the negative stuff, the stuff that we're suppressing because we don't like it. And it's, it feels, you know, like, like for instance, the violence that you talked about right, that we need to actually recognize how can this feeling of anger or violence be a support for the highest good instead of suppressing it, instead of making it the bad guy, and then it actually comes out as the monster in ways we don't like, how can we actually incorporate that and bring it in and use that for the highest good, use our anger for the highest good? When we think about those things, however, there are other things in the unconscious that get suppressed as well. Like for instance, all of the things that we concretize as outside forces that we want, like freedom, like peace, like abundance, right? Abundance gets concretized as an outside thing that looks like a really nice house or a Cadillac or, right? And so recognizing that these suppressed things are not just all the things that we think of as these negative things, there are superpowers too, yes. right? And so we need to remember that all of the archetypes, all of the different ways of being are all within each one of our own psyches and nature. How much do we, you know, going into what Montague says about reconnecting with nature when an important uh, uh, um, uh, skill that is, what, it, what an important missing piece that is to remember that we actually are nature and we've been suppressing that, haven't we? So that's mm -hmm. another piece that we've been suppressing. So not to just limit our awareness of what's in the unconscious to these things that we think of as like, you know, shame and fear and all this stuff, but instead really recognizing the superpowers and the deep connections that we are suppressing every single day. And that's where the curiosity comes in to say, what do I not know about my own self? What do I not know that is actually going to make me whole? rather than disintegrated pieces. And if I can recover all of those disintegrated pieces, whether they are shadow stuff that I've projected onto the other sex, gender, race, religion, political party, I can pull all of that back into my own. And also all of those concretized superpowers that I have projected onto an outside other and bring that all back, nature, oh, God, the God image, all of it, bring it back to a recognition of wholeness of self. And then my third word is compassion. You know, it takes an immense amount of compassion for self and for other, uh, but it starts with self to be able to say it is, not only okay to be wrong, but it is essential part of the human experience to not have the whole story. 
And I think that's what we need is to start really honoring and actually glorifying the fact that we never have the whole story. And so the question instead is, how can I be right in this movement and prove my rightness and get one over on the other guy because I'm so much more right than they are mm -hmm. to ask ourselves, what is it that I don't know? And to go into every conversation and every new experience with that fact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, and I, you know, I agree that it's important to realize that um, the, the shadow is not just dark shadow, but also bright shadow where we project. It's basically what we don't acknowledge about ourselves. And often those are talents, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we project on others. And, and uh, we can recognize our shadow by what triggers us. Mm -hmm. right from another person um, if someone triggers us we are looking at our shadow and and uh, and and people fear that shadow work is about being willing to face how terrible we really are mm -hmm. but it's really about seeing essential qualities that we've repressed and feel guilty about um, and as Carl Jung said, whatever part of you you do not love will become hostile to you. Mm -hmm. and, and so we start judging other people when we see that unacknowledged part of ourselves and we get, you know, we get triggered. But, but it's actually something that um, we need. Uh, the shadow is always showing us what it is that we need to own, whether it's something that we judge as good and and you know something that we uh admire in another person or whether it's something that we uh you know denounce in another person uh that we judge in another person because even that you know quote unquote dark shadow is about something that can help to heal us and bring balance into our lives we just have to find the neutral version of it which is the the challenge you know because mm -hmm. it it shows up as what we deem as negative but if we, you know just like reggie and and um and montague were saying about kids who are you know what what society calls add you know and so they're labeled as negative but actually they just have energy and, you know, and they're not happy, just they can't just sit still and they're not supposed to be sitting still, right? So anyway, that's, thank you. I, I, well, you know, that's how it goes. That's how it connects with mythology. And this is why story and myth is so deeply connected to deep psychology. The way that I study it is that all of the stories that we hear, whether it's through movies, cinema, you know, or old uh, uh, for Isha stories, love, or uh, stories from Native America, all of the stories, the conflicts are always conflicts within your own psyche. Always. Exactly. The conflicts, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita or David and Goliath, they are never to be recognized as a conflict between us versus them as an outside. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing, Montague, when you talk about changing the narrative, that, that this is a really important thing because I think even as adults, we forget that sometimes. We think that these stories are about something outside of us, but the conflict is always internal. It always starts there first. Yeah. And so these things that you know, you're talking about, Gloria, as far as shadow stuff, dark shadow, that idea of finding that piece of whatever that, that, that bad guy, you know, the villain, Mm -hmm. is that is actually that conflict is what illuminates the superpower of the hero mm -hmm. you cannot have a superpower without a villain you cannot have courage without fear for instance so if anybody says they don't they're not afraid i question i go okay mm -hmm. then wh then where's your then where's your courage because how can there be courage without fear so even just to recognize the value of that that villain to illuminate the power of the hero that is within you. 
and that's the piece as we're moving through it that it can become really a really a, an active practice you know yeah becky did you want to say something yeah um i gave a talk last week to a group of uh yogic so citizen wells is a is a yoga or citizen engagement group and they asked me to talk about resilience. And so something Shakti said reminded me of what I said that I wanted to share with us and share with everyone. Like um, we're in a culture that celebrates happiness and joy and all the things. And we've demonized the beautiful nature of adversity, right? So we've so demonized adversity that we forgot that you can't have resilience if you aren't challenged. Right, and so that's an essential part of my activist practice now where I'm just like, yo, people like, oh, this is too much, like blah, blah, blah. I'm like, mm, mm. This is exactly what's required for us to demonstrate the resilience in order for us to transcend. At least that's how I'm seeing it, you know what I mean? So all of the, you know, look, 2020 has been whatever you want to call it. But in this adversity, and Shakti knows this, like the reason that we're talking now is because my teaching practice was born of this moment. I was challenged, my community was challenged, and it was as if the ancestors were like, you're up, kid. And so, like, in this moment, <laughs> and love laughs at me, because you know, you know what I'm saying, right? So, in this moment of adversity, I, I could have been like, nah, I'm good, whatever. But I was like, okay, so what is the lesson here? Like, what am I being, what's being called of me in this moment? So, we, instead of being a binary society, we need to start having that like, you can't have one without the other. So that's your courage and your curiosity and your compassion. You see, those are the right. three. You got to have that courage, that curiosity that says, what is here for me? What is this call to action? What, what do I not know? Right. I need to take that step. Right. And then right. that courage that's behind that step. And this is not, you know, this is not something you can make other people do. This no. is why this is a, inner transformation but Ridge, when you say this is you know these are the conflicts these are the moments of adversity that bring us into a new awakening that i say well yes and and of course it's going to be uncomfortable for those who have not done this inner work right. of course it is not going to be something that feels like you know a a, a, a an opportunity to those right that have not done this in our work. So this is where we have really no choice right now in this particular work, the inner work piece, but to just exemplify it day in and day out. Yeah, and one, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll close by saying this, like I'm really resonating with the wisdom shared by Montague because like that, mm. I'm telling that story to change the narrative. Right. Yes. Oh, adversity is the worst. Mm -mm, this is dope, <laughs> right? Adversity is amazing. Right. You know, yeah, I got to sell it a little bit because that's the job of the teacher. <laughs> but, you know, adversity is amazing. Right. You know, I have to sell that. Maybe some people will believe it. And for those that have come to my teaching practice, they told me this morning, which almost made me emotional. To th they thanked me for that because they're now viewing life with that curiosity. Right. So rather than being like, woe is me, everything sucks. It's a mm -hmm. challenge. But what is the challenge requiring of you? So Shakti, thank you for like lighting that spark in my mind to share that with everyone. Just so even in this moment, so when we talk about heart-centered activism, when we talked about like, oh, adversity, resilience is required in this moment and resilience can only come from the heart, right? If you haven't done that inner work, if you don't have like vulnerability and you can't share from that, Mm -hmm. then, then, then there is no transformation. There is no transcendence. So th that's just what I wanted to offer. And if we run from adversity, it chases mm -hmm. us. It doesn't get better, right? We have to acknowledge that there's no coincidence. You know, it's there for a reason. It's there because that's what it takes yep. to wake us up in whatever, you know, whatever, whatever aspect of life we're experiencing it that's what we have drawn to ourselves so to wake us up right so yeah and sometimes gloria just to say one more thing about that sometimes it takes you know as love said too you have to we have to acknowledge the personal wounds and sometimes it takes just doing an about face into adversity and being able to say i did it wrong yeah i got it wrong 
Mm -hmm. I, 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 I I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> I climbed the wrong mountain, right? I'm learning. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. I yes. mean, sometimes we struggle and struggle and get to the top and realize, uh oh, this isn't this mm -hmm. isn't what I wanted. <laughs> this isn't what I thought it would be. But also something that you said, Shakti, about um, uh, what was it about? Um, mm, no, it just slipped out of my head. Uh, it'll come to me. Um, I don't know. Yeah, something that triggered something and then it left. But anyway, um, yes, thank you. That that uh, you know, when 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 we do shadow work, it actually releases energy because it takes a lot of energy to keep the shadow repressed. Right? We don't notice it because we're so it's you know, always seems like it's always been there. We don't notice the energy that it takes, but it does take energy. So it's a good reason uh, to do shadow work. Another good reason is that um, we don't see our own shadow, but we see other people's shadow more easily. And that means that other people see our shadow, even, even if we don't see it ourselves, right? So I had a, a a student once and she said when I realized that I wanted to I wanted to see what other people were seeing <laughs> you know because it it will pop out in inappropriate times right when when we are trying to uh, maintain our persona okay uh, so this is uh, something that <laughs> this is is kind of a funny thing that I um, that occurred to me a couple of days ago. And so I'm just going to put this out to all of you. Uh, events in recent months have been witnessed or caught on cell phone cameras. This is a quote, by the way, a quote by a woman, uh, an article that I read, and this woman, Jila or Gila, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, G I L A H, Yellen Hirsch is her name. And and she said, events in recent months have been witnessed or caught on cell phone cameras. Now we can see all, now we can all see what is happening. We are all having our eyes opened to the injustice that is real in our country. Everyone can see what was easier to hide in earlier years. Seeing allows those of us who might have been comfortable in our assumptions to question them and to have a chance to walk in another's shoes, unquote. So it, it seems that especially in this time of pandemic, when many of our usual activities are still suspended, there's a valuable opportunity as more people become aware of injustice to present them with the alternative by recording acts of compassion, of kindness and unity. And wouldn't it be great if these videos could go viral so as to move people to look for ways to embody these acts in their own sphere of activity? In other words, modeling, right? So we all have cameras at the ready wherever we go. And um, what are some typical or unusual occurrences in your own life that you could share publicly to inspire others? What if we put out like a unity challenge on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, um, challenging others to record scenes of unity and kindness and compassion that they might want, they might witness or generate. Um, videos reflecting and evoking the good, the true, and the beautiful. Can you think of that? Um, anybody have any ideas? I just was thinking how we need a balance <laughs> to all the all the i mean we see it in you know funny little animal videos but that doesn't inspire me <laughs> i mean they're cute but it doesn't inspire me and i'm just wondering you know it would be fun to do that to uh to show like for instance a conversation between uh the person was it montague who said about the person talking to the Ku Klux, the black person talking to the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, that was me that said that. Oh, that was oh, you. Okay. Me. Yeah, something like that would be so inspiring. Um, Stephen, were you going to say something? Oh, one thing that I find helpful, we, 
you know, there's so much pain and suffering. It's, it's really good to remember this planet that we all inhabit together. And of course, when we look from space, we don't see any kind of boundaries. We, we see a planet. Um, so I find almost a compulsion to daily put out pictures of natural scenes that are around yes. me uh, that can maybe offer a sense of hope and beauty. I think that the sense of beauty um, is a really important piece in all of this. Yes. Uh, so I, I find this compulsion, I feel like it's part of my ministry to put out pictures every day from the various uh, hikes and, and the places that I go, and because then people all can come together on something beautiful. I, I remember sometimes you visit a national park and there's people from all different cultures and races and they're all marveling at this, this beautiful place. I'm thinking Mount Rainier is, is one of those places. Uh, where everybody's just lost in wonder at this massive, massive, beautiful mountain and the wildflowers. Um, so that's, that's, you know, one way I think of doing well, and, it. And also, it's not just inspiring to see, but it, it, it moves you to want to preserve it. That's correct. Right? So in, 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 you know, I, in the service of... I also, I think that emphasizing the... We're never going to have the energy to uh, work on social justice and environmental justice just based on suffering and a sense of morality. That's There's right. also a sense of falling in love with the other, yeah. falling in love with another race, gender, landscape, whatever, and realizing that, um, that we're head over heels in love with a, a reality that's completely different than what we know. And I'm not real comfortable with photographing or videoing people because I, I don't like them to feel like they're being an ob made into an object. Um, mm -hmm. But I know whenever, <clears throat> whenever there's some kind of conflict in a society, I like to put a quote by somebody from that particular race or gender or whatever that um, is just um, so inspirational uh, that, that people can remember. We need, if, if we're concerned about social justice, we need the whatever the group is that's being oppressed. We all need them because they're a part of us. Of they're a, they're a part of ourself um, mm -hmm. that we're not in touch with. Yes. Um, and I, I remember a quote from Martin Luther King that that um, I mean he said in every in every black person there's a little white and every white person there's a little black, and <clears throat> I felt that growing up outside of Philadelphia. Um, I learned so much from people that were all different races and ethnicities. And I realized, wow, this is a missing part of me that I'm seeing in the other person. So in a sense, that's shadow in that you're not aware of the, the parts of your own self that are there until you see it reflected in another person of a different race or gender or different landscape. So it's that falling in love with another uh, who is actually a part of our undiscovered self that I think gives us motivation um, to help care more. Yes, and and these days with the genetic, uh, you know, everyone or not everyone, but a lot of people uh, trying to sending off whatever they send off, you know, to get their genetic yeah. heritage. Um, I think everybody should do that in this country, especially the white supremacists. So that they could see, <laughs> yeah. it was, yeah, you know, I mean, they could see that uh, there is more than meets the eye, even in there. And even if we delve, I'm going to talk about light skinned people here. People don't delve into their roots. Yeah. If, if every person from a light skinned white um, uh, group delved into their roots, they would discover something indigenous. They would discover there was a connection to the earth. There was something yes. tribal, and yes. you would also discover suffering. Like, like if you're an Irish person, my God, what's happened to the Celtic peoples? You know, um, and and it's it's indigenous, it's nature based, and there's some suffering there. Maybe it would give us a window into cu current sufferings that are happening today if we realize that all those things are in our own roots. I apologize. I'm getting away from your question about video. No, that's okay. That's okay. We, you know, 
uh, it's but okay to discuss. People talk about white, but what is white? Let's look into the roots of it and we'll see all these ethnicities that have a very similar um, um, uh, worldview uh, that often people are lost. I have Native American friends, and whenever I talk about my ethnicity, which is Armenian on one side and a Quaker, English Quaker on the other, she says, wow, you know your roots. That's good. And most people that I, you know, run into in the dominant society, don't, they don't even know their roots. Uh, so anyway, I think that's a part of the healing is, is for all of us to delve into our roots and realize there's a lot in common there. Yes. And just to what um, Stephen is saying, you know, it ties into what Love said earlier about the importance of our ancestry and how in order to decolonize white minds, white people who were actually colonized first, you know, since they're the ones that went and, you know, their minds were colonized to form this white, uh, this white idea, you yeah. know, it's actually, because really there's no white person on this planet. Um, and, that, and that whiteness, that whiting out of your history, that whiting out of other cultures, that, that need, that insatiable need to suck in and take from other cultures because you've forgotten who yeah. you are based upon this white idea and you defend this white thing behind this white God, you know what I mean, who's white and far and distant, you know what I mean? He's in the clouds, he's white and he's in a white, you know, it's this perfection, this idea of this white perfection that is destroying the planet. Instead of like saying, yo, where do you actually come from? And what lands were they working with? What animals were there? Oh, you have a, whoa, working with animals, working with trees, you know, you have culture? Whoa, hold on, there's things you were doing that were in accordance with the seasons? Yeah. You know what I mean? This, this opens up a whole nother can of worms for healing. Imagine a world where people weren't rewarded for calling themselves white first. Absolutely. You know, where there was a system that rewarded you for being white and fitting a certain look. You know, imagine the kind of healing that could happen. And I think that kind of realization is happening in some people that, you know, are white um, due to what happened during COVID. What happened, someone asked me, they said, Montague, there's been cell phones for a long time. We've been seeing black people being shot for forever. You know, why is this different? I said, well, this time we didn't have the pacifiers. You know, the church was closed, the bar was closed, the movies were closed, your job was closed. You're at home sitting there like, ugh. So now when they pop up, <laughs> you're having to sit there. Distractions. Like, yeah, I don't have my pacifier. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. And yeah. so people are like, yeah. whoa, and, and, and there's protests like all the time now. And it's, it's an interesting new time. But just to tie it into what Stephen and Love were saying about the ancestry, that's a big part of the healing. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, we have somebody, uh, and I'd like to kind of move into um, a, just a more general discussion, bring the audience in. And there is someone who... Lori, if I could offer one quick statement. Sure. Uh, for the videos, what I've been doing, so I'm looked at in the, in the movement, so progressive, moderate, uh, liberal, as like a, a, a storyteller. So what I've been doing is I, I, I post videos that are like both and, right? So talking about like, yes, everything is quote unquote terrible, and here's what we do about it, right? So again, so again, your wisdom, oh. Monica, you sticks with me because like what I've been doing, so it's not like puppy dogs, like, you know, whatever, like that, that's not sustainable. That's cotton candy. Those are empty calories. Yes. But, <laughs> but if you, if you switch the narrative and be like, yes, there's a raging pandemic and racial injustice, and here's how we're coming together. And here's how we're going to come together. Like, that's what people want right now. Like, like in, in an app, in an absence of bravery, to shock these point, people need to see courage. In an absence of heart centeredness, people need to see vulnerability. So so what I've taken to in my teaching practice and my activist practice is being like real, like people are just like, you keep it so real. I'm just like, I have to, are you paying attention to what nature's doing right now? Mm -hmm. Like mother nature and father time are telling me to keep, they're, they're keeping it super real. So mm -hmm. how am I going to have artifice in a time where mother nature and father time are being hella real? You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so. I just want to say to answer your question about the cameras, like one of the things I've been doing is like doing a lot of selfie stuff, but with that both and orientation. So trying to remind folks that like here is the through line, like again, 
resilience is bred from adversity. So like, like switching those stories and coming up with a common through line so people can A, adopt more critical thinking instead of being like spoon fed opinions. Like, what do you think about what's happening right now? But also just touching like your heart space because you know, we talk about heart-centered activism. The biggest, the biggest manifestation of heart-centered activism is inspiration. Right. So like if I as an activist don't inspire you, I personally don't think I'm doing my job. So mm -hmm. to, to, to go back to the theme, like for me, heart centered activism is the, the, the storytelling which leads to inspiration, which to Stephen's point earlier, when you get deep into the heart space and you touch that underground aquifer, like if I touch your heart, you forget that I'm black. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. Because wisdom has no color. That's right. It, if we could only connect on that level, there would be no racism, there would be no divisiveness and polarization. If we could just connect on that level. Um, thank you. Thank you, Reggie. Uh, there's some, someone in the audience has her hand up, and I am trying to unmute, but uh, you're, um, you're still muted. So, uh, maybe because of the format, you might have to type your question into the Q and A. Uh, just click on the Q and A box. And right now we have no open questions in the Q and A. But if you if you can't seem to unmute uh, yourself, then then just type your question into Q and A, and then I can read it and uh, we'll address it. Or if it's a comment, just type it in. Okay. Um, yeah, the thing, you know, another thing that occurred to me, Shakti, when you were talking about doing our inner work, um, I had, a, when I was in my early 20s, I had a spiritual teacher and I lived in a yoga ashram for two and a half years. and. And he was just amazing. Uh, he was actually American. His name was Rudy. And, uh, and, but he had studied in India for a number of, for like 11 years or something. And, um, and, and he sometimes talked about, uh, you know, how, you know, what Carl Jung called it, the, uh, the last frontier, doing our inner work, right? And, and Rudy would, say it, it is the most exciting thing um, to, to grow inwardly. There's nothing more exciting, there's nothing more dramatic than that. But when we are not doing it, when we're not busy doing that, we project and we, we look for excitement on the outside. We, we create drama in our lives, you know, because it's not happening where it should happen, right? And, and I was thinking of that one day recently, and what occurred to me was, I was thinking about this whole economic paradigm that we always have to be growing, that our economy always has to be growing. And if Apple makes the same profit this year, which is gigantic, that it made last year, the, stock the stockholders won't like it. And they'll drop, you know, because because they they haven't grown. And I was thinking about that, and I'm thinking how toxic that is, and why do we do that? And what occurred to me is, as humans, we have this inherent need for for inner growth, and when that isn't happening, it gets externalized. So we project that onto the material world, and that has to grow, right? Uh, we need. Uh. Uh, we need to grow materially and so you know just uh just can I, can, can I respond can I respond to that I'm I I you know I think anyone in a relationship of any kind so that's all of us knows that the inner work is not the final frontier <laughs> because if you've ever gotten yourself all figured out and then you get married or you're in a relationship <laughs> you realize that you don't and that it's an ongoing process forever and ever and ever. And so I think it's really important to recognize that when we're talking about psycho-spiritual development or, you know, inner work, whether it's shadow work or 
you know, that, that it doesn't ever end there, that the entire point and purpose of having these awakenings and recognition of whole self or wholeness is for deeper, real, true com- connection. That when we're compassionate with ourselves, only then are we able to actually hold compassion for another. Yes. When we have you know, courage, we have the capacity to truly encourage another. So mm-hmm. it's this, this is like, you know, I, I would have to see the whole entire context of Jung's uh, final frontier is the inner work, because I, I really believe that the inner work is where it has to begin and <laughs> continue and, con- mm-hmm. and constantly coming back, constantly cycling back. Just when you think, you know, okay, I have some movement here. I have some space. Things are opening up. Then, then you know, real life yeah, happens, that, and we're. What in, you're saying is is not in contradiction to what no. you said, because because uh, there are so many things in the outer world, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a job, whether it's whatever it might be. Whenever we are presented with some kind of conflict or some kind of, you know, adversity or, or uh, it triggers the inner work, you know, we have to go inside. So, Mm -hmm. so that is uh, part of, you know, the reason. Um, I have a comment from Sri and she says, thanks to all our panelists, much wisdom being shared here. From my experience as a dark skinned immigrant, I have faced some of the same issues of a us versus them rather than us and them. Um, what support can you all offer to support America's immigrants? And I see you, you raised your hand, um, love. Uh, so if you want to, if you want to give your comment first, then we'll address Shri's question. Okay. Um, my comment was was about your question, actually, about documenting the things that are, you know, in celebration of unity, of, you know, bringing, that are bringing healing, that are bringing understanding, the beauty and the richness that we see. And I think that that's being done in many ways and many facets. I know that in terms of my maintaining a heart act activism and being able to stay balanced while we do such intense work it's been like, I have to do that. I have to get out in nature. I don't necessarily make a movement out of, you know, filming it, but I do try to provide that balance on my social media platform so people can, you know, get back to nature, get back to being grateful for the love that they have, get back to the blessings and the progress that they see despite the horrors that they're living with. I think that black and brown folk and folk that from marginalized communities are living with such horrors and trauma every day and the wounds are so heavy and deep that it takes a lot just to be able to stay in that space of heart-centeredness and gratitude because you know you are being wounded and traumatized daily. Every time you go on Facebook or IG or whatever platform, you know, you're seeing those incidents that are just, you know, they're inhumane, they're soulless. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and, and to not become sen- desensitized to it, like you have to go somewhere and get back into that thing that is pure, that nature, that love, that water, that sun, that mountain, those herbs that, you know, Montague spoke of. So I've been relying on that to keep myself balanced and healthy through this. Um, And then the piece around immigration, I think that that is, uh, there's a huge movement in support of immigration rights. It's still, there is so many crimes against immigrants that haven't even had a name put to them. So when we talk about those horrors, when we look at the immigration camps, when we look at that work, you know, that those efforts that have been done to to stop and to interfere and to prevent further loss and separation and tragedy you know um 
I get grateful. I get grateful to see what is being done, but we know that it's not enough. We, but, but I do see progress. I give thanks for the progress. I mean, here in California, um, our governor and um, many of the other political uh, representatives are taking very serious means to support our immigrant communities and in putting their, you know, putting money behind that work, putting laws and legislation in place that, you know, preserves the rights of immigrants. And then there's a de another piece of it that we haven't even touched on because we're too stuck in just surviving, which is um, the piece around what do we do to support people who are in this country and what can we do, what can they do for themselves to get the support that they need just to live through this. So, so we haven't even been able to touch on those aspects of just, you know, and healing. What does healing look like? And then, you know, there's another level of it that has to do with intercultural prejudice and discrimination that people are very fearful of talking about for fear of being seen as racist. So there's real issues among Black folk who have felt discriminated against by immigrant communities. And, and they're not, we're not talking about that. We're not dealing with that and what's up under that. So mm -hmm. I, I hope to see that we can do that work as a community because we can't have healing without addressing that, without addressing the impact of the cartels that they're having on this, this fight. So, so yeah, that's a whole other workshop. We need a whole series, Gloria. <laughs> okay, I'm up this for it. I'm up for it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, speaking of shadow work, you know, the the it seems to me that the the people who are xenophobic, you know, who who uh, are, are are people who whose ancestors immigrated to this country, they're not, you know, I don't hear Native Americans, um, you know, despising the immigrants and 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 uh, yeah, talking about them. Uh, Reggie, did you want to say something to that? Yeah, so immigrant immigrant support is a key part of my activist portfolio, right? I've been to some of the camps uh, that are per perpetrated by the government that are housing brown men and brown babies uh, just simply because they came from another country, right? And uh, one of the things I would say to Sri is that, um, you know, we have to begin, all of us have to begin looking at, looking at each other as one another as opposed to the other, right? So... That work begins in leadership. It's almost impossible to expect that to come from someone. It has to be modeled, right? Mm -hmm. And so this goes to some of the work that I was saying, that Love wanted me to talk a little bit about more. The work that I'm talking about, mutuality and these sorts of things, this is like, this is like my alchemy, right? Like this is me trying these things out because people look to me as a leader. So in order for me to be, in order for me to lead people in a direction, I ha I'm basically building the plane as I'm flying it, um, but trying this out. So what can I do to offer support to America's immigrants? Number one, like my political work is to shift the paradigm so we see each other as, as common and equal as opposed to like one is better than the other. So shifting the political consciousness of our country um, to where like leadership is not embodying supremacist ideals. I think that's the first start. Um, and then from that point, the other part of that is viewing one another as, as it's in love, viewing one another um, in compassion, viewing one another as my brother or sibling or sister or however you identify. It, I don't care where you came from. Again, I said this in my remarks, like I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm a, hum I'm a humanitarian, mm -hmm. you know, whose dharma has been given to like work in the political space. But my job is to uplift all people, specifically bracket black and brown people, because in this meat suit, like I'm a black dude from Baltimore, Maryland, right? So like, I got to rep for people who look like me because of the trauma and oppression that's been visited upon us. However, and in addition to, so no, and, in, in healing myself, in modeling this leadership, it's creating space to see it's us and them as opposed to us versus them. So I'm trying to model that not only in my inner work, but in the vulnerability of sharing my inner work to show that it's possible because, you know, let's just be brutally honest. Like most people don't speak like I do. Most men don't speak like I do. 
most black men sure as heck don't speak like I do. Like, so I just try and model that um, inclusion in all aspects of my life and work. And so I hope that that, I hope that answers your question to some extent. Okay. Uh, anybody else have a question in the audience? This is the time. We've got 15 minutes uh, left. And I can ask one more question to the panel if we don't, you know, until we get another question from the audience. Um, and that is something that we've already touched on several times, but uh, the corruption, the violence, the inequities in our society are all based in greed and anger and or cynicism, uh, which in turn are all based in fear. Since love has a far higher vibrational frequency than fear, a small amount of love can counterbalance a large amount of fear, according to David Hawkins' book, Power Versus Force, as well as many spiritual teachers. How can we inspire people to approach their activism from a place of love and not fear? Anybody? And let's see, there is a chat. Ah, Shri is saying thanks to all our panelists. Oh no, that was her original. No, she's had great responses so far. Uh, this is all amazing. And okay, there's another comment from someone. Oh, to Shri. I think that's from, I think that's from Love. Um, oh. Gloria, oh. I, can, I can offer a response to your first question and then we can go to yes. that. So um, what I do and tomorrow, I'm, I've been asked to give remarks at a vigil um, about the Supreme Court situation. Mm -hmm. And my colleagues have asked, and so this is, you've heard it here first. So like in this, I'm basically gonna be, I'm gonna be subversive tomorrow. So thank you for being my, 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 my circle of confession. But um, <laughs> I was asked to give a speech uh, tomorrow um, in support of the, or, or against what the president's trying to do with the Supreme Court regurgitating talking points rooted in anger, uh -huh. right? So my speech tomorrow is going to be nothing of the sort, <laughs> right? Okay. My speech tomorrow is going to be higher my, I'll actually, I'll, I'll read y'all the first paragraph um, because this is how spirit works with me. Like, I didn't know what I was gonna say. I took, I, I did my yin practice, went to sleep last night, woke up and started typing. I was like, y'all work quick. So <laughs> this is, this is, the, this is the opening paragraph. So this, as someone born and raised in Maryland and DC, I have a particular fondness for autumn. It could be because my birthday is next week, but it's more likely because the shift associated with the change in season makes things a little crisper and a little more clear. And it's in that spirit that I come before you this afternoon because it's never been more clear that we need to step away from brazen and craven rushing to get things done and conveniently forget that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. So that's my speech in front of thousands of people tomorrow where people are expecting me to talk out of anger, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to do it, yeah. right? Because what does that do? Love at its, at its essence is the great disruptor, right? Love in its essence welcomes you in. It kind of puts you off guard a little bit, but in that off guard, it softens you to the point where you can receive what's being offered, right? Yeah. So... I offer that in my activism and I will do that tomorrow uh, because I don't, we don't need to be angry. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I use anger as a creative force, right? Mm -hmm. So the anger that I feel, listen, like I said, I'm, I'm 45 years old and black, black and male. I've been pissed for a minute, but I've been able to take that anger and be vulnerable like i built a, yeah. I, I built a teaching practice off of this like i I've, I've inspired youth with this anger and so that comes from loving myself enough to do the work and then from that abundance i can be like well here's what i feel mm -hmm. right so can i jump off that reg yeah go for it yeah i didn't mean to interrupt you no yeah i love what you just said and i love what you wrote because it gives me some insight i mean i 
I'm getting to know you, man, it's just so cool. Um, through these panels and wow, it's been such a cool journey just this last few months. And um, but just to even have a little more insight through what you wrote, and that's the connecting piece. You said you spoke of being vulnerable and sharing your heart and sharing your insight. And your question, Gloria, was about love. How can we inspire love? You know, and, and Stephen, what you said too, as a mystic, as a as a fellow mystic, <laughs> the idea of love and, and really falling in love with one another, falling in love with nature, falling in love with other, because ultimately, you know, according to yoga tantric teachings, the the especially non-dual teachings, the point. Or, and also, you know, all the different ways that we look at dualism, non-dualism, the point of being in separation is for the recovery, for the real, the, the witness, being in witness, right, or witness. And that is the beauty of the separation. We want to remember that our goal is not, like, I think it was Reggie or someone said earlier, not to be the same. It was Montague, not to be the same, right, like all of the same cells in the body but also, but to be in individuated unity, right? Which is really important. And I think that to answer your question, what really just speaks loudest to me is to get to know, right? When we, when we, when someone is, when we are in love, when we love someone, it is the context. It is our understanding of them. You know, I've been with the same man for over 15 years. And there are things about him that someone else would just be like, no way, that's a deal breaker. But I know the context. I have context. So because of that context, because of that backstory, because I've seen it, I witnessed, I know his heart, I know the story. I am in love with him. And this is how we fall in love is to get to know, to be with. And so this is my, this is just my, you know, kind of quick response is, to learn more about, and it goes, you know, to answer Sri's question too, of what kind of support is, again, that question of what don't I know? What don't I know about this culture? What don't I know about this person? What don't I know about this group of people, this collective? What don't I know? And as I get to know them better, and I see that, you know, Reg puts his heart right there in the first paragraph, so that people can see him, know him, have some context to fall in love with him, essentially, right? To feel that connection. And then that's the piece that brings us to the experience of, of integrated or individuated unity. Can I tag on that? If yes. I could tag on that family and just, I just got to add this because my ancestors are standing back here screaming <laughs> and I love and I love everything that was said and forgive me for going off camera for a minute I'm on a cleanse and so when it comes time for my eating I have to eat some of my sugar will anyway another workshop but <laughs> I want to just say the the holiness of rage I want to honor that and specifically black rage and and while you know i totally believe in nonviolence, i practice nonviolence, um but i'm also armed you know i'm armed with my own magic i'm armed with my rituals i'm armed with my consciousness and and the weapons of ogun you know and if it comes down to protecting my family and myself that's what i will do and i think that is just as holy i think those protesters when i watch those babies out there of every race taking those rubber bullets and there was one brother one black man every time i talk about him i almost go into a possession because when i remember this brother he had his shirt off and he was all muscular and he was standing there and they were just hitting him and it was like i don't know what was in him but it was like he couldn't even feel the hits he just and, and i knew he was standing up for the ancestors and so is there you know was malcolm any less holy than Martin, when Malcolm was in his revolutionary, absolutely not. He was in the height of his power and what he did, even though he came to understand that there was another way and another view to how to do it, but what he did was just as holy and it played a significant movement. So when I see these babies, while you know, I'm not one for you know, tearing up anything or destroying anything, I understand, I understand their rage 
and I affirm their rage because it is proof that they are resisting. It is proof that they are alive. It is proof that they are saying not only no, but H no. It's not happening anymore. And, and the change that we see is in part a big result of what these young folk have been out there doing and the allies and the elders and everyone who has been fighting. Even Ruth Ginsburg, Ibaye, Tonu Tonu, going back and returning to the ancestors has something to do, yes, with how this fight is now being fought, that it is also being fought in the ancestral realm. And, and there is rage there too, and it is healthy rage. So, I, so when I think about it, I also, while I support nonviolence, I support love as medicine, and that's what I bring you know, a lot of the time, but I also think that the rage is necessary for healing because the wounds and the, and the, you know, the crimes that have been committed against humanity are such that we have to acknowledge the depth of them. We have to go down there with Olokun to the bottom of the ocean and retool those bones and acknowledge what happened to them and the stripes that they still wear so that they can come back and be cleansed and purified and reborn. So that's all I want to say is that, you know, you. I don't want to dismiss that rage either. We need it. I say. I think it's important to acknowledge the rage. Um, and it's also important to channel it in a productive way, you know, not just indulge it and certainly not repress it, but to channel it in, in such a way that it can actually heal, you know, that we can do productive things with it, uh, not destructive things with it. Yeah. Right. You know, oh, go ahead. go ahead. Okay, I was going to say, um, I think it was kind of, you know, and I, I like what you're saying because, you know, there, once again, there's a difference between being overtaken by the rage, right. you know, but then using the rage as fuel is yeah. different by just being engaged and aware. It's different. Yeah. I think one of the most damaging thing I've heard some yogis tell people, disenfranchised people when, you know, uh, when they're talked to is everything is as it should be. You know, yeah. you know you're disenfranchised. There's systematic oppression. You haven't eaten in weeks. Oh, you're being shot by the police, but um, everything is as it should be because I'm good, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And it's such an objective thing. And I think the narrative needs to shift to everything is as it is. And we will work together to help you find peace in this and healing in this, whether that means fighting or whether that means even hiding or writing, what, however you process this, but everything is as it is. And we're going to find the healthiest expression of that, you know? So anyway, I just want to throw that in the pot. Thank you. Well, this is why what you just said, both of you, is why I don't experience love as being opposite of anything. I experience love, real love, what I'm talking about, as something that is beyond opposite. So, you know, there is a love, like with a small L that's like, you know, the romantic Hollywood, whatever kind of love, abuse, you know, whatever, conditional, whatever. But what I'm talking about when I talk about love and wholeness as wholeness is something that is beyond all opposites. And so, so it is so all encompassing and all pervasive that it actually includes your fear. It actually includes your anger. See, the love that I'm talking about is so big and so pervasive that, that it, your fear, your anger, it, it ain't got nothing on this love. It I doesn't said. have anything on this love. And so that's the love that transmutes. You want to talk about alchemy? That's, that's the, the transmuting love that changes anger, that changes fear, that transmutes it into something that is for the highest good. Yeah. It's, it's the context. It's a love mm. as principle, love as context for everything else that goes on. Um, I know that we could go on for another couple of hours, but unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. Um, I was going to... Uh, have concluding remarks from everybody, but I think we've just kind of given them. <laughs> Unless, it, um, Love, you're muted if you want to say something. 
Oh, no, no, no. I know it's oh. time. We have like oh. one minute. No, there yes. was a person who was listening and they had posed the question, oh. the best reason, and that's like a whole nother 30, but it was the best uh -huh. responses to racial profiling when you are a large body black man, what, oh. you know, what like Reggie and Montague, what in their experience, but I know we don't have time today. Yeah. So we have, well, maybe we got to have a part two. <laughs> I just want to take our last few sessions, seconds to just thank all of you. This has been an amazing conversation and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for uh, the attendees. Uh, this has been recorded. So uh, there have been people who, um, Shri is saying thank you all panelists. Um, anyone who was not able to join us and did register or wants to register to hear the recording uh, is perfectly welcome. Uh, we will have it on our website, um, you know, uh, not immediately, but within, within a few days, probably we'll have it. Uh, so, so again, um, my great gratitude to all five of you and to our audience attendees as well. Um, thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you again. Hopefully. Thank you, Gloria. Blessings to you. Uh, blessings, you. love, and grace to all. all Good to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet all of you. Thank 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 you.